So this is a picture of uh, the basement in our house, and we have lived in our house for about three years now. And when we moved in to the house we're in now, the basement was completely unfinished, just a concrete floor, exposed ceiling, concrete walls. And so we knew when we moved in that we wanted to build out that space at some level for our kids so they could have a place to go downstairs, invite their friends over, and just be at home in that space for them. And so when we moved in, in the summer, we kind of worked through the summer, and then when the fall hit, I really started in on the project. And it wasn't a really complicated project. It was spraying the ceiling black, putting some lighting in there, building a couple walls to hide the furnace and the pipes that come in from the street with the water, and then put a simple foam floor floor down. But it took me a while to kind of get going and actually figure out what I was doing. And so it took me a better part of the winter and early spring months. And I was able to get it to this point by Memorial Day. So when Memorial Day hit, I was like, I'm going to stop doing this because I want to go outside and start working on our yard and do things out there. And what I said was, when the fall rolls around again, I'll come back and I'll finish it. Because you might notice there are some things that aren't finished. Namely, you have some doors. There's three doorways that don't have doors, but just have curtains in front of them. There's no trim around the, 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 the base of the floor at all. And I said, I'll come back and finish it in the fall. That was two years ago. <laughs> two years ago, I said, I'll come back in a few months and finish it. And it's still unfinished. And I wonder if there's anybody here this morning who has things like that in their house as well. You have projects that you started and they sit for a while and you think to yourself, yeah, I'm going to get back to that, but it just sits unfinished for months on end, years on end. Anybody? Anybody willing to admit that? Yeah, we, we all do. We have things that are unfinished because starting things is a lot of fun. Starting things is exciting. There's new energy, there's new possibility, there's the hope of something being fresh and new, and you think to yourself, ah, a new adventure. I can't wait to dig in. And it's not just with house projects, it could be lots of things. Like if you're reading a new book, you see this book that somebody recommends, the cover is really slick and cool looking, it looks like an exciting book, you're like, oh, I can't wait to get into that book. Or maybe it's training for a half marathon or a 5K, and you're like, I've always wanted to do it, and this is the year, and I'm going to go for it, and I start training, and I work at it, and it's amazing. Or maybe it's starting a new business, a little side hustle for something just to generate a little bit more income and you get excited about what that could grow into. We all have these moments where we want to start new things, but then there comes this moment when that new thing or that new idea isn't new anymore. And the excitement has kind of waned. The book drags on and gets slow. The, the training for the half marathon gets really difficult because you have to wake up early in the middle of winter while it's snowing and go out and run five miles. The, the business venture is more complicated and you face more obstacles than you would have thought. The renovation project costs more money than you anticipated. And so in those moments, we're tempted to quit. We're tempted to say, ah, I'll just come back to it later maybe secretly knowing later is never going to happen. And this idea of finishing well and finishing strong and continuing on in what you started is also true with our faith. Because when it comes to following Jesus, starting to follow Jesus can be really exciting because he offers hope and he offers encouragement. There's salvation and inspiration and he changes your life. But then along the way, it can get hard because if we really take the words of Jesus seriously, following Jesus is sacrificial. Jesus is very explicit about it. He says, count the cost for what it will require to follow me before you do. If we take Jesus seriously, some point along the way, we will be faced with what does it mean to live sacrificially? Because sacrifice it's all about following Jesus. I mean, it could be something as simple as you've had a long day at work, a really hard day. You're so eager to get home, walk in the door, put your stuff down, and just unwind. You pull into your driveway, and your next-door neighbor is in the backyard and just wants to yuck it up with you for who knows how long. They, too, have had a hard day, and they need somebody to lean on, and they need somebody to vent to, and you happen to be the convenient listening ear. And in that moment, you start to feel the Spirit say, hey, why don't you just invite them in 
for dinner, and you're like, but, but I just want to go be by myself, right? Or maybe you're at work, and you're taking an elevator, and somebody's running up to the elevator asking you to hold the elevator, and you realize it's the person who spread gossip about you around the building, and you just want to let the door close and make them wait, but the Spirit's saying, no, 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 hold the door for them and demonstrate kindness. Or maybe you're at the Brewers game, and the guy behind you is super obnoxious, yelling loud and being crazy, and ends up spilling his drink and his food down the back of your seat, and you're just like, oh, but he really feels bad about it, and the Spirit says, hey, why don't you go the extra mile and go buy him another round of whatever he was having to make up for it? Yeah, you're like, no, that's too far. That's too far, right? Like, okay, that is a little much, right? Following Jesus is sacrificial. It costs us something along the way. And not only in those areas that we just described, but there's something very relevant to where we are as a church when it comes to sacrificially following through with what we have started. And so the question for us this morning is, are we going to continue to finish the work we've started, or wane in our engagement with what God has put in front of us. And so we're going to look at chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians. We're going to bounce around to a couple different verses, but we're going to start reading 2 Corinthians chapter 8, specifically verse 10, and here's what Paul writes. He says, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. What is this matter? We'll say it in just a minute. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do so may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. So the issue at hand in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the topic of giving and generosity. See, there's this subtle storyline throughout the New Testament of Paul doing a fundraising project for the church in Jerusalem. You you see it in Acts 24, he mentions it as he's on trial before Felix. You see it in Rome, Romans 15. He's coming to Rome and he's saying to them, hey, this is part of what I'm doing, so just give you a heads up that we're going to talk about this. He does it in 1 Corinthians 16. He spends this amazing chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 talking about the resurrection. And then he says, 16, verse 1, now about the collection for the Lord's people. But it's most prominent and most detailed here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Now, the nature of Paul's work was that he traveled around the Mediterranean, and he started new churches, and he visited existing churches that he had previously started on previous trips. And during his travels, the church in Jerusalem fell on hard times. Maybe they were experiencing persecution. There was thought to be a famine at one point in Paul's ministry. And so Paul has the idea to raise funds for them as he travels to encourage them and provide unity for all the churches that are being started. Now, this is a map of the area where Paul worked, the Mediterranean. This is now common day Greece and Turkey. But back in the first century, Paul was in Macedonia, which is the top left, that little purple area. That's Paul, a good looking guy, little Paul. And what he's doing in Macedonia is he's preparing for his trip to Corinth, and he writes them a letter. He writes them a letter saying, hey, I'm coming. Get ready for my visit. I'm on the way. And in his first visit, right, because he's been there once, and he's written them once already, both in his first visit and his first letter, he's talked about this collection, this fundraising project. So in part, this letter, 2 Corinthians, serves as a heads up, hey, I'm coming back, i.e., get the money ready that you have set aside so that when I get there, I can collect it and take it to Jerusalem with me. But the other thing that he does in this letter, specifically in chapter 8, is he tells the story of what he's been experiencing in Macedonia while he's been there. As he's getting ready to go to Corinth, he says, hey, you're never going to believe what I've experienced here in Macedonia. They heard about this fundraising project that I was doing for the church in Jerusalem. And when they learned about it, they begged me, they pleaded with me to participate, to give to that church. And you'll never believe their circumstances. They are not great. 
They are not ideal. He goes on to say they experienced severe trial. They were undergoing extreme poverty. And he said in the midst of their extreme trial and their poverty, something welled up in them so that they practiced radical generosity and they gave beyond their ability. It's amazing to see the generosity come from this group of people who basically has nothing. And then he says this, writing again to the church in Corinth, verse 8. He says, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Now, it kind of sounds like Paul is being a little manipulative here, huh? Like, hey, there's this church in Macedonia that I'm witnessing. They're giving out of extreme poverty. You don't want to have them outgive you, right? So make sure you keep giving so this group of under-resourced, underprivileged people doesn't show you up. It kind of sounds like Paul might be saying that. And it's kind of funny because when you read later on in chapter 9, it almost sounds like Paul has said something similar to those in Macedonia about the eagerness of the people in Corinth. He goes on to say this. This is chapter 9, verse 2. He says, For I know your eagerness, again, writing to those in Corinth, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them, that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to give. He said in chapter 8, verse 10, we read it already, that those in Corinth were the first to give. They were the first to demonstrate eagerness to give to this fundraising project. So it kind of sounds like what Paul is saying to those in Macedonia, it's like, hey, there's this church in Corinth. Like, they're given in incredible ways. Can you match what they're doing? And then he says to the church in Corinth, hey, these people are under-resourced, and they're way out giving you. you got to catch up. You don't want to have them beat you, right? You could read what he's saying and think that he's pitting these two churches against each other to try and maximize the amount of money that he can take to Jerusalem. Now, I'm actually not so sure that is happening. Because that would be antithetical to everything else Paul talks about when it comes to operating out of what we would call a gospel motivation. A gospel motivation is to do things out of sincerity, not out of guilt, not out of coercion, not out of manipulation or fear, not out of comparison, like, oh, we got to beat them, we got to show them up. Gospel motivation is doing anything that God puts in front of you purely out of gratitude and love for what he has done for you. And Paul knows that. And that's the consistent message that Paul gives throughout all of his writings. So what I think he's doing here, right, because we have to ask the question, if he's not manipulating these two churches, what is he doing? And what I wonder is if he's trying to illustrate how sacrificial generosity inspires more generosity how sacrificial generosity actually inspires more generosity in other people. There's a high school in Texas called uh, the Lone Star School, and it's a unique school. They have a football team, as you would imagine most high schools in Texas do, but this school is part of the juvenile correction department in Texas, meaning the students who attend this school are convicted criminals. They have felonies on their record. They are inmates at this institution serving time for the crimes that they have committed. And if they demonstrate good behavior, if they demonstrate responsibility and keep up with their schoolwork, they earn the privilege to play for the school team. Their mascot is called the Tornadoes. Now, when they play games, they don't have a home field. They don't have a home fan base. They're always on the road. They're always traveling. They're always going to other schools. And when other teams learn that the group of people they're playing are convicted criminals, as high school students around football can sometimes be, they're not very nice. They call them names. They say things to them. And it can be brutal. And they don't have a whole lot of resources. So they're not the greatest of teams. And so sometimes they just get walked over and blown out. So in one season they played, one of their opponents was Grapevine Christian High School in the Grapevine area in Texas. And the coach learned about who these students were, 
And he decided to write a letter to the booster club. He decided to write a letter to the parents of the players and some other people in the school to say, hey, you know what? What we should do is we should show these kids above and beyond the love of Jesus when they come to play our school. They're not going to have a fan base that travels with them, so we should give them a bunch of our fans to go sit on their side and cheer them on. And what if we were to give them a pep band on their side so they could be motivated by the music of the pep band? And what if when the game starts right before kickoff, they've never been able to run through a spirit tunnel to enter onto the field and run through a big banner, what if we gave them ours and we let them experience that instead of our team this week? And what if we gave everybody who's sitting on their side a roster with all their numbers and names so they can cheer them on by name? You can find videos about this online, and they interview the kids and the students who are part of the tornadoes, and it was mind-blowing for them. They said, they were calling me by name. I've never experienced that before. It was an incredible night for me. Now, there was another school in the area called Crum High School, K-R-U-M. They heard about what Grapevine Christian did, and they said, hey, we can do that same thing. We can give them a pet band. We can give them a meal before the game. We can give them fans. We can cheer them on by name. They were inspired by the sacrificial generosity of one school playing this team so that they did it themselves the next week And it changed the way this one school, these boys, experienced what it means to have dignity as a young athlete rather than be labeled as a convicted criminal. Sacrificial generosity inspires more generosity. See, Paul isn't trying to squeeze these two churches or manipulate these two churches to get the most money he can out of them. He's trying to illustrate that sacrificial generosity inspires generosity because for Paul, the amount of money they give isn't the point. It's not about the amount. See, all throughout chapters 8 and 9, Paul is trying to highlight that your attitude in giving is more important than the amount. Your attitude in giving is more important than the amount. He'll he'll say that, chapter 8, verse 12. He says, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. It's not about the amount. He's not expecting people to give a certain amount. Rather, he says this in verse 12. Five of chapter 9, he said he's eager to receive the gift that they've set aside because he's confident that he will receive it because it's been given out of generosity, not because it's given begrudgingly. He's saying it's not about the amount. You don't have to begrudgingly give some amount that you think I'm expecting you to give. What God is after is you giving willingly and open-handedly. He says this again, that your attitude is more important. Chapter, seven, chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Your attitude in giving is more important than the amount. And the reason that's true is because God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your money. God doesn't need the money of those in Macedonia. Paul knows that God doesn't need the money of those in Corinth. God doesn't need our money. Psalm 50 says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In the ancient world, wealth was measured by livestock and land and possessions, not bank account numbers. And he's trying to say God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. Like everything is him. Newsflash, you're not really an owner of anything. You're a steward of what God has entrusted to you. It all belongs to him. It's all from him. He's calling us to demonstrate to the world how it's all also for him. We are called to be stewards. And what God does do is he invites us to participate with him by investing in eternity for other people to invest in the kingdom work that has eternal implications. Because Paul knows that when you give sacrificially and when you give cheerfully, it actually shapes your heart. When you give out of a place of generosity and willingness, it loosens the grip of money's power in your life. 
Have you ever experienced the power of money? Money has tremendous power in our world. Money has tremendous power over our own well-being. You get anxious and overwhelmed when it feels like, oh, it, it, it's slipping through my hands. Oh, I have to pay this big bill. Will I have enough? I, I feel that all the time. All the time. I go through stretches where I'm checking my bank account two, three times a day. Did it go anywhere? Is it still there? What's this Starbucks charge for $10? Did Becky go buy something online without telling me, right? Like, I just get anxious about it. But then there are other times I, like, I calculate what I'm giving, and I calculate it just out of, like, pure fact and, like, logistics. And I don't think about the joy of what I get to do. And then there are other times, like, I like to overinflate my own ego, and I think, man, I'm really sacrificially giving. Like, God, you're really lucky to have me on your team because I'm such a generous person, right, patting myself on the back. When in reality, God's like, I don't need it. I have way more than you could ever imagine. But he still invites us in to participate with him in investing in kingdom work that has eternal implications for others. Because Paul knows there's a bigger purpose to our giving than just how much. He goes on to say this. This is chapter 9, verse 10. He says, Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that's Paul's way of saying God is the source of everything, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Essentially what he's saying is that when I come to, get, to visit you and I collect the money you've set aside and I bring it to the church in Jerusalem, what will happen is they will thank God because of you. They will be so overcome with gratitude that they will thank God because of what you have done. Because their physical needs will be met, but spiritually, they will also praise God with thanksgiving. That's what he goes on to say in verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing with many expressions of thanks to God. Paul is trying to show that kingdom giving cultivates gratitude. Hopefully gratitude in ourselves. Hopefully we are grateful. Wow, God has blessed me with way more than I need. So therefore I can be a blessing to others. I can give generously because God has always supplied everything that I need. So hopefully kingdom giving cultivates gratitude in us, but hopefully it also cultivates gratitude in other people. That, that God is able to provide what they need through us. Now, over the last year, we have been talking to Meadowbrook and talking to the church about helping us fund the project that we are experiencing. And I just want to take a minute and say thank you. To, to know that from me, there is incredible gratitude. That thanksgiving has overflown my heart from my heart. Because this church has given above and beyond. It's been amazing to watch. Not only with, with resources, but with time, with effort, with energy, with all sorts of things. And so the church just needs to hear, thank you from me. People have been so generous so kind. Our budget is strong, what we've planned out for this year. Like we're operating at a really good place. We're looking really good going into this next year. It's been an amazing stretch to see all of the funds come in. But what Paul is saying here in this passage is he's saying, finish what you started. Finish what you started. He, he's saying to that to the church in Jerusalem or in the church in Corinth to say, hey, you've committed to giving to this fundraising project don't stop because I'm coming. And he's saying that to us. Finish what you started. Hopefully we're around the halfway mark of the giving season and maybe a little bit beyond the halfway mark for the project itself. He's saying finish what you started. And not for the sake of having this big, beautiful building and we can pat ourselves on the back and we can be more comfortable. Because somebody just this morning said, hey, these chairs are way more comfortable than those pews. Good job, right? <laughs> It's not about having a cool, slick space so people walk in and they're like, oh, wow, look what you've done. It's not about being comfortable. It's about 
rooting ourselves here so that over time we can see people in this community come into this building, meet Jesus, have their life changed, and then they say, thank God for Meadowbrook Church. I don't know where I would be without Meadowbrook Church being in this community. This church has revolutionized my life. They have changed the way I perceive everything. So if we finish what we've started, we have the opportunity to experience what Paul is saying here, that when we give sacrificially, when we give generously, and we give for kingdom work that has implications into eternity, gratitude will overflow. He says many expressions of thanksgiving to God will be granted. And so we just want to say thank you again so much for all that you've done. And to say, we think this is just the beginning of amazing days ahead for Meadowbrook Church. We also want to continue to invite you into engaging in this project. Part of that is through uh, giving of your time and your ability, right? If you can come in midweek and help clean things and help set up kids' classrooms as they start to open up in the weeks to come. If you can clean on Saturday mornings, to Saturday afternoons to help prep the building, that would be great. And also, if you weren't with us a year ago when we made the initial push for the fundraising, maybe you're now in a place where you can give, where you can give financially, because while we're in a good spot, we still have a long road in front of us. The original plan was to have, you know, coming out of here, a mortgage of about $500,000. We'd love to see that be reduced. We'd love to see that be non-existent. We would love to be debt-free as a church. And if you're in a place where you can give financially, we would love to see that happen too. But at the end of the day, again, it's not about the money. It's not about the building. It's about participating with God in reaching the world so that other people who don't know him can thank God for what he has done in their life through our church. So Meadowbrook Church, may you, as Paul says, continue to excel in the grace of giving. May your heart overflow with joy as you practice sacrificial generosity, and may it be fueled by the desire to see other people come to know and follow Jesus. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done. We recognize that you are a good and gracious God. You are good and faithful and consistent in our lives, and we just stop to say thank you for what you have done for us, both in sending your Son to secure salvation for us, both in changing our lives and our hearts, giving us everything we need and more. And Lord, I pray that we would be able to in turn do the same for others, that we would be able to give of ourselves and give to you so that the world may come to know and follow you. We pray this in your name. Amen.